topic today is cerebral venous thrombosis. Yes, as the name implies, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis uh, refers to thrombosis of the venous channels that drain the blood from the brain. And what we talk uh, about regarding the venous channels are the cerebral veins and the dural sinuses. Uh, now this condition is uncommon. It uh, constitutes about 0.5% of all the strokes that you see. And also it has a very variable clinical presentation. And therefore, uh, uh, you need to be on the lookout uh, and have a high index of suspicion to uh, come to a diagnosis of cerebral venous thrombosis. And very often we see that there is a delay in the uh, diagnosis of this condition. Uh, patients who are diagnosed early and treated early have a good prognosis. So it is important that although this condition is rare, it's uncommon, uh, you should not uh, miss this condition because the final outcome is good with these patients as compared to arterial strokes. Now, before we get on to uh, more details about venous thrombosis, I think we need to get back to anatomy and uh, try to recall uh, what these sinuses and the cerebral veins are. So uh, if you look at this diagram, uh, you will see that, uh, I'll just go through them. The, the, the main uh, sinus is the superior sagittal sinus right on the top. And then within the brain is the inferior uh, cerebral sinus, uh, inferior sagittal sinus. And then there is a confluence of the veins from where you have the right transverse sinus and the left transverse sinus leading into the sigmoid sinus and then to the internal jugular veins. Now uh, within the brain, we have the deep vessels, the deep veins and the sinuses. So as I mentioned before, you have the inferior sagittal sinus there. And then you have the deep veins, which are the internal cerebral veins and the basal veins. These two join together to form the great vein of Galen, which combines with the inferior sagittal sinus to form the straight sinus. Now there is another set of uh, uh, sinuses and veins is the cavernous sinus. So the cavernous sinus uh, vessels that drain into the cavernous sinus are the vessels veins coming from the ophthalmic veins and the veins from the face. And they drain out through the superior petrial cell sinus and the inferior petrial cell sinus. So uh, since this lecture is based on 10 points, we'll start with the first point, which is the location of this venous thrombosis. Now you can divide this into two main groups. One is the superficial and the deep. So, so the ones that involve the superficial veins, we call them the superficial cerebral venous thrombosis and the deep cerebral venous thrombosis is uh, involvement of the deep veins, which are the basal veins, the internal cerebral veins, and then the vein of Galen and the straight sinuses. Now you can uh, divide this further into uh, the location of uh, involvement. So the commonest of this is the superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, uh, following which you have the lateral sinus thrombosis. Now the term lateral sinus refers, some people refer it to a combination of transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus. So those together is often called the lateral sinus. Uh, less common is the deep cerebral vein and straight sinus. So the deep sinus thrombosis forms about 10% of your cases. And then rarely, uh, depending on uh, what study you're seeing, whether it's a recent one, a very old one, the incidence of cavernous sinus is getting less because of the presence of antibiotics nowadays. So you have a small percentage nowadays, about 3% is your cavernous sinus thrombosis. Uh, when you add up, you get more than 100. That is because uh, in very often you have multiple locations in your thrombosis. So over 50% of your patients may have involvement of more than one sinus at the same time. So you have either superior sagittal sinus with uh, transverse sinus thrombosis and so on. So point two it will be about the pathophysiologies. And I think uh, 
uh, you can follow this uh, depending on right at the top you will see you could either have a cerebral vein thrombosis or cerebral sinus thrombosis so if you have either it starts from there the thrombosis of either the vein or the sinus you have increased venous pressure and then down here which is where you have the increased venular and capillary pressure and this is an important step uh, where your next set of uh, effects occur because of increased venular and capillary pressure so there are three branches coming down here uh, because of increased venular pressure you have reduced capillary perfusion you have is sorry uh, you have uh, reduced capillary perfusion, you have ischemia, and then you have cytotoxic edema. So cytotoxic edema refers to edema within the brain cells itself. So they are, uh, and these lead to infarction in the brain. So this line causes infarction in venous sinus thrombosis. So you get venous infarcts there. Then the second one is where you have disruption of your blood-brain barrier. <coughs> And as a result, you have vasogenic edema. Vasogenic edema is edema in the uh, extracellular space, uh, so uh, outside the cells. So you have vasogenic edema, and then sometimes you see edema of the brain in venous sinus thrombosis. And the third branch is where you have, because of the increased pressure, you have rupture of your veins or capillaries, which results in uh, parenchymal hemorrhage. So these are the three main effects that you might see in venous sinus thrombosis, the infarctions, the cerebral edema, and the hemorrhages. And also, uh, because of uh, increased venous pressure, uh, or because of the cerebral sinus thrombosis, you see the cerebral sinuses are the, you know, uh, uh, are through which your CSF is absorbed through the arachnoid villi. And therefore, when you have thrombosis of the cerebral sinuses, uh, your absorption of your CSF is affected, and therefore you have increased intracranial pressure developing as a result, and these patients develop papilledema and so on because of that. So here you have two main effects. If you recall this again, uh, one is the increased effects of increased venular and capillary pressure, and the effects of increased intracranial pressure. Now looking at the etiology and risk factors as point three, now CVT has many uh, etiological factors and risk factors. And very often we see that a single patient may have more than one risk factor. But after thorough investigation, you might still find that about 25% of your patients, you cannot find an etiological cause and they remain idiopathic. Now if you look at the list of causes, it's a long list. Uh, this once you diagnose your patient with venous sinus, you might have to go through this list and see to find out whether this, your patient has any of these uh, causes because your long-term management will depend on the etiology of uh, the sinus thrombosis. So I'm not going to go through this whole list. This could be found everywhere in, uh, if you search for it. But I think I need to mention a few things here. Uh, the commonest causes are thrombophilic states. So you have uh, thrombophilia, prothrombotic states. And second important cause is the uh, related to pregnancy. So you have either pregnancy or postpartum period being a very important cause. Inflammatory causes like vasculitis, uh, beches, and uh, inflammatory bowel diseases. And then going down are the infections uh, which cause predominantly the lateral sinus thrombosis uh, and the cavernous sinus thrombosis. Uh, further down, an important one is the medications and the oral contraceptive pill is uh, one of the important medications. Another one they have mentioned here is IV immunoglobulin. Uh, you, we have seen patients, uh, you see, uh, who have guillain barre uh, syndromes who have been treated with immunoglobulins and they end up developing venous sinus thrombosis. So you must keep that also in mind. These are all rare, but uh, these are well described. So of all that, the common risks that you should like keep in mind is the thrombotic states, uh, puparium and the pregnancy, oral contraceptive pills, 
uh, face and ENT infections and dehydration. Now CVT is common in young females and this is because of the post-pregnancy, postpartum and the use of oral contraceptive pills. And the highest incidence in this group is during the postpartum period, the first three weeks postpartum. So if you see a patient uh, coming postpartum with headache, a prolonged headache, you can't just ignore that, thinking it's migraine or something else. Uh, you have to keep this in mind because as I said, these are rare things, but if you don't keep that in your mind, you might miss these conditions. Now a quick word about infections. Uh, infections uh, causing CVT are, were most common, as, as I said before, because uh, in the pre-antibiotic area, but they, if you have infections on your face and paranasal sinuses, you can develop cavernous sinus thrombosis. And if you have ear and mastoid infections, uh, you can develop lateral sinus thrombosis. Uh, these are less common now with the availability of antibiotics. Now, uh, something new, which we now in this uh, time of COVID-19, we have seen more and more patients being described who have uh, cavernous, uh, have cerebral venous thrombosis. So there have been a flurry of uh, reports uh, from June this year, uh, where patients have been described who, who have developed uh, various uh, venous sinus thrombosis as a result of COVID. Okay, so point four is regarding the presentations in these patients, the clinical presentation. And you can divide this into four main groups. Um, it could be intracranial hypertension, which presents like headaches, uh, focal neurological deficits, seizures, and encephalopathy. So uh, you can group them into these four categories. And we'll quickly go through this. Firstly, the headaches. Now, headache is the commonest presentation of venous sinus thrombosis and it's the typical presentation in 90 percent of cases you these patients will complain of headaches and this headache is could be all sorts of headache but commonly it's a diffuse progressively worsening headache over a few days but you must remember that these patients can have acute headaches like acute thunderclap headaches which we see even with subarachnoid hemorrhages that type of headache also could develop in some of these patients and because of uh, raised intracranial pressure, uh, patients develop papilledema and uh, diplopia due to false localizing sign uh, of the six nerve palsy. Now, your focal neurological deficits, as you mentioned in the pathophysiology, these patients can have cerebral edema, venous infarcts, and hemorrhages. And depending on where you have these uh, infarcts and hemorrhages, uh, your signs will differ. So if you are involved, uh, if the hemorrhage or your effects are in the motor area, you will have weakness. A speech area, you will have dysphasia. And similarly, in visual areas, you can have visual field defects. Now, uh, if you have sagittal, superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, you must remember the superior sagittal sinus drains the both hemispheres. So you have a tendency of having uh, its effects on both your hemispheres and some of these patients can present with paraparesis. So if you have a patient with uh, hemorrhagic infarcts in both hemispheres at the same time, uh, you must uh, remember that this might be uh, non-ischemic, uh, uh, non-arterial, it might be a venous infarct due to superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. So that's another clue uh, for making your diagnosis. Now seizures, uh, you can have focal seizures and generalized seizures and seizures are common compared to uh, most of the strokes that you see uh, in venous thrombosis, 40% of them uh, will have uh, uh, seizures. So if you have a patient who comes like a stroke and uh, has seizures, then you must uh, think of the possibility of venous thrombosis uh, because uh, comparatively, uh, seizures are much more common in venous thrombosis than in arterial uh, infarcts. And final presentation is uh, reduced level of consciousness uh, and coma 
and there are two situations why you can get this uh, one is if you have an extensive uh, superficial thrombosis like extensive superior sagittal sinus thrombosis then you have severe uh, edema venous infarcts hemorrhagic infarcts and brain herniation and these patients can uh, uh, become uh, unresponsive and go into coma uh, deep venous sinus thrombosis also uh, can result in bilateral infarcts uh, in your basal ganglia and thalami and that also uh, can get your patient uh, uh, into coma now another quick word about uh, the presentation which can vary a little depending on which uh, uh, sinus or uh, vein is involved so if you have a superior sagittal sinus thrombosis uh, as i said previously you can have headaches papilledema seizures and paraparesis now if you have a lateral sinus thrombosis these patients can sometimes present only with raised intracranial pressure like headache and papilledema so you must uh, uh, remember that also uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis patients uh, present differently they present present with eye signs so they can have chemosis proptosis and uh, ocular motor palsies and finally deep venous sinus thrombosis patients uh, can develop uh, vertical gaze palsy and as i mentioned before reduced level of consciousness and coma so uh, this is a patient with uh, deep venous sinus thrombosis uh, you can see that both of the thalami are uh, involved uh, and there is uh, infarction in uh, venous infarction in both thalami in this patient due to uh, deep venous sinus thrombosis so radiological diagnosis now radiological diagnosis is point, uh, the next point uh, imaging is the most important uh, uh, diagnosis uh, method uh, for uh, to come to a diagnosis of venous sinus thrombosis so uh, the methods that you could uh, use would be a ct brain could be non contrast or contrast and a ct cerebral venogram MRI brain and MRI V brain. So whenever you are looking at uh, CTs and MRIs, you must always have at the back of your mind a high index of suspicion of sagittal uh, of uh, venous sinus thrombosis. Uh, otherwise, you can easily miss uh, these things if you are not uh, on the lookout. So the first thing that we usually do in a patient who presents uh, is a non-contrast CT. and you might see a uh, infarct edema or hemorrhage as we mentioned before and but you what you need to see which edema infarcts and hemorrhage may be obvious but what you need to look for is whether there is thrombosis vessel so a thrombosis sinus or thrombosis cerebral vein will appear hyper dense uh, on your ct non contrast like any uh, like the arterial infarcts as in the previous lecture you would have previous uh, time you would have heard that uh, in a middle cerebral artery thrombosis you have a hyper dense middle cerebral artery similarly uh, in uh, in uh, venous infarcts also uh, if you uh, the vessel looks hyper dense uh, on your ct brain so here is a, a ct scan of a patient and if you just look at it without knowing what you are looking at you might pass this as normal but you must look at uh, uh, if you are very sharp then you should not miss this you should look at this uh, triangular area which is the posterior part of the superior sagittal sinus which looks hyper dense so which means there is a thrombus within that uh, which is uh, and there is no blood flowing through that so therefore it looks hyper dense on your uh, non contrast ct so the sign that we call uh, this is the dense uh, delta sign or a dense triangle sign there are two words used for this the dense dense delta sign which means thrombosis of your superior sagittal sinus similarly you can uh, have a further dense signs uh, you have this uh, transverse sinus so if you are not sharp enough looking at uh, the ct you can easily miss this uh transverse sinus which is thrombosed here it's a clot within the transverse sinus similarly in the other picture you see uh, uh deep sinus uh straight sinus thrombosis right in the middle here a small streak of uh, uh hyperdense 
area, which is a thrombose uh, straight sinus. Uh, again, not much uh, showing at this moment on the rest of the brain. Now, once you have done your CT, if you want to, uh, you can proceed to do your non-contrast uh, contrast CT. And here you are looking for uh, the thrombus, which will create a filling defect in the sinus or in the blood vessel. Usually in the venous sinuses, because of lack of flow, you will see a filling defect within the sinus. So here, this is another CT scan. And here you see uh, the thrombus here, uh, which is uh, uh, not with after contrast, you will see that the contrast is not filling the venous sinus and you have uh, a, a, a non-filling area within the sinus and enhancement of the dura around it, giving this triangle uh, uh, appearance, right? So this is the empty delta sign that you see in patients with uh, venous sinus thrombosis. This is seen in contrast images. So when should you suspect a venous infarct? So you are, we frequently do uh, pay, you know, CT scans on patients, but then we, we might pass it off as an arterial infarct. So we have to, there are certain situations where you should uh, think, could this be venous? So uh, if the infarct is beyond the typical arterial territory, so if there is an overlap uh, in territories of, uh, of your infarct, which is not fitting into a particular arterial territory, then you must think, could this be venous? Then similarly, if you have multiple bilateral cortical infarcts, uh, again, uh, not that it, it is uh, always venous, it is, uh, you know, you have to keep that in mind so that you don't, uh, you know, miss the rare venous thrombosis. If, if there's an infarct very close to a venous sinus, again, that might be a clue. And also multiple hemorrhagic infarcts. Now, if hemorrhagic, inf hemorrhagic infarcts are much more common with venous thrombosis as compared to arterial thrombosis. So if you have especially multiple hemorrhagic infarcts at the same time, then again, you might have to think you know, could this be venous? So these are some of the situations where you have to be on the alert uh, so that you do not miss venous thrombosis. Now here's another CT scan and the image on the right, uh, uh, you will see there's a, there's an infarct here. And if you have, if you just look at that, you can easily pass it off as a, a, a arterial infarct. Right, but uh, if you look closely, there is a small hemorrhagic area here, and if you look at the vessel here, you will see that there is thrombosis of the vessel. So, uh, so you have the dense clot sign here, and the hemorrhagic infarct, and the infarct very close to the venous sinus, and therefore this is a venous infarct. So you can maybe, if you are not careful, you can miss venous infarcts in a situation like this. Uh, you can proceed to do an MRI brain and on the MRI brain uh, you will if you look at the vessels on the MRI brain there you will see a normal vessel will show a flow void. Now flow void is a low signal seen in vessels which are flowing blood. So if the flowing of blood stops as in thrombosis uh, then you might visualize the thrombose vessel uh, differently. So here is another image of MRI and on your uh, left side of your image, uh, you will see here the, the flow void where you see a hypo intense uh, vessel uh, which where the blood is flowing, which is normal. And on the other side, you will see the sigmoid sinus, which is thrombosis. So you can see the thrombosed, thrombosed, uh, you know, thrombosis within the vessel on the other side. So you have to keep in mind that, you know, uh, you can pick this up uh, even on the MRI uh, plane image here. Then you, uh, next uh, modality is the venograms. So you can do CT venograms or the MRI venograms. Uh, the venograms are useful again to detect thrombus because thrombus appears as a filling defect. So here's a CT and uh, here you can see that on your on the left side, you have a, a, a flowing 
transverse sinus, but you have an absent sinus uh, in the side where the arrow is, and that shows because there's a filling defect within the thrombus vessel. Similarly, on MRV, you will see that there is a thrombosed area uh, in the sagittal sinus, and there is an absence of flow, and therefore you have an area of the sagittal sinus which is not visualized. So these are useful methods uh, which uh, help you to uh, confirm your diagnosis of uh, venous sinus thrombosis. Now you have to be a little careful, especially uh, when looking at vessels, because especially the sinuses uh, can be hypoplastic or atretic. And these are anatomical variations which sometimes you see, and sometimes especially with the left transverse sinus. So sometimes in normal people, when you see Ludo uh, uh, MRVs, you would see, uh, you know, sometimes you see the absence of a left transverse sinus, and then you must not uh, mistake it for a thrombose transverse sinus. So you will be over diagnosing these patients unnecessarily if you are not careful uh, uh, and not on the lookout to see whether these are not hypoplastic or atretic vessels, or atretic sinuses. Okay, point eight would be a quick word about D-dimer. D-dimer is uh, a useful marker to diagnose thrombosis. And if you are in acute situations, you might find a level more than 500 uh, micrograms per liter. Now, uh, but that's not always elevated. So a uh, negative result will not rule out a CVT, uh, but uh, it is useful if you uh, do and you get a positive result. Finally, in the management, there are three areas in the management. The main area is anticoagulation. Second is uh, symptomatic treatment. So you have patients having headaches, seizures, uh, raised intracranial pressure. So you will have to manage those uh, part of the patients, uh, those symptoms of the patient. And finally, you'll also have to treat if there's underlying etiology that you have found, like a malignancy uh, or dehydration or hematological disorder, then that also needs treatment. So we will not go into all that, but I will go only on to the management uh, with anticoagulation. Now, anticoagulation is the main form of treatment in venous thrombosis. You could either anti start treatment with IV uh, unfractionated heparin or sub, uh, subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin. Uh, you have to use therapeutic dose and this is the first line treatment for uh, uh, as the initial treatment for this patient. Now after that you could uh, put them on a long term treatment with oral anticoagulation uh, with vitamin K antagonists like warfarin and the duration of your anticoagulation long term will depend on what the underlying etiology that you have found in these patients. So the duration of anticoagulation, uh, there are some guidelines from the American Heart Association. It's a little old, but then that's the, uh, the guidelines that is available in 2011. And they group the uh, venous thrombosis into three groups depending on their etiology. So the first one is uh, the provoked cerebral venous thrombosis. So if your venous thrombosis is provoked by a very reversible uh, short-lasting cause, for example, if you have taken oral contraceptive pills and then you have withdrawn it, then that's a provoked uh, venous thrombosis or is a postpartum is a provoked thrombosis. It's a, it is a, a, you know, reversible, a short uh, insult. Then you can anticoagulate for three to six months. Now, if it's unprovoked, unprovoked means that uh, you can't find a reason why these patients had this venous thrombosis. So you go through the etiology risk and all the risk factors, and still, if you come into an idiopathic group, uh, then you, you can't find a reason. Then you label them a unprovoked uh, venous thrombosis. In these patients, you will have to anticoagulate for six to 12 months. And then you have three other situations where you have to anticoagulate long-term, indefinite or lifelong, which is a recurrent cerebral venous thrombosis. So if you have a venous thrombosis happening again, second time, then you might have to then anticoagulate lifelong. Or else if your venous thrombosis is associated with a pulmonary embolism or DVT, again, that requires long-term anticoagulation. And also if you have found 
a severe thrombophilia situation, then definitely you will have to treat them long term uh, indefinite anticoagulation. Uh, one uh, little uh, point that you have to remember here that uh, as we mentioned again uh, previously that uh, venous thrombosis patients very often the in their infarcts are hemorrhagic. So very often you will see the CT scan showing hemorrhages in these patients and when you come to anticoagulation uh, everybody is little worried uh, you know to anticoagulate uh, hemorrhage when you see hemorrhages on the scan. But uh, what in, in the situation of venous infarcts, anticoagulation should be, uh, pro, you should proceed with anticoagulation even in the presence of hemorrhagic infarcts or ICH. And the studies have shown that uh, even you anticoagulate, these hemorrhages do not enlarge in size. And if there are no hemorrhages, they don't develop hemorrhages into these infarcts. So generally, uh, if you see infarcts, uh, if you see hemorrhages in these patients, uh, there is no indication to uh, get too frightened. Uh, you have to make sure that this is a venous infarct and not an arterial infarct. And if you are sure it's a venous infarct, then you can proceed and continue anticoagulation even if there is uh, hemorrhagic transformations. And finally, uh, the prognosis, 90% uh, uh, show a very good recovery and that is uh, 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 a good reason why you should be you know all out to diagnose these patients and treat them early uh, five percent of these patients die if they are very large venous infarcts and hemorrhages because of herniation anyway the mortality is lower as compared to arterial strokes so therefore again early diagnosis and early treatment for venous infarcts is uh, 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 is uh, you know is very important. So that's uh, that's all I have to say for the moment. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Taliboy. Complete. Yeah. So uh, this is like a summary of what I said uh, before. Uh, number one, CVT is uncommon and you need to have a high index of suspicion uh, for the diagnosis. So that's very important point that you have to take home. Uh, the main pathophysiological findings are the increasing the vein, venular pressure and capillary pressure and the decreased CSF absorption. And these uh, changes are the ones that result in all your uh, 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 hemorrhages and uh, you know, increased intracranial pressure. The superficial sinus thrombosis is much more common than deep sinus thrombosis. Our prothrombotic states, puparium, pregnancy, and OCP are the main risk factors that we commonly come across. And about 25% of the cases, you cannot find the identifiable cause. Our four types of presentations of CVT are increased intracranial pressure, focal neurological deficits, seizures, and encephalopathy. Deep CVT causes infarction in bilateral basal ganglia and thalamide. Point seven, uh, neuroimaging is very essential. It's the main uh, stay in the diagnosis of CVT. Anticoagulation should be commenced immediately regard regardless of whether hemorrhage is present. IV heparin or low molecular weight heparin are the first line therapy followed by warfarin for long-term therapy. And finally, the duration of therapy is dependent on the underlying cause, whether it's provoked, unprovoked, etc.